thing I'm going to do while I'm up here is I'm going to ask a gentleman uh, who I was sitting with over there, and I've sat with him many times over many years, uh, since a conference uh, like this one, as I said, that was organized by the Alliance for Democracy in uh, Colorado in, I think, 1996. Is that correct? Maybe 97? I met Sherry Honkelow there. I also met David Cobb. And Sherry has asked that David introduce her. So please welcome David Cobb. <laughs> fight went on to file for a recount, to defend the right to vote, the right to participate in representative democracy, it was David Cobb, not John Kerry, who was the presidential candidate who filed for a recount in Ohio. Before. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ben Mansky is a decade younger than me, and I am very proud to tell you I have learned a lot from that man. <laughs> a lot. And a lot of those conversations, Brother Mansky, and the, one of the things that repeatedly came up in those conversations is what is it going to take to actually make the systemic change that we so desperately need, so richly deserve in this country? Because, you know, I don't want to just talk about living in a world of peace and justice, and democracy, and ecological sustainability. I want to live in it now. Yeah. Yeah. In those conversations, what I have come to know, and I think what you have come to know, and those hundreds that I know are actually watching right now on live streaming, and the tens of thousands that wish they were here and are going to be influenced by the conversations that take place here, one of the things, one of the the, the core principles that I have come away with, and I think you have too, and that is the knowledge that in order to actually create and win systemic social change, what we actually need is a recipe that's actually fairly straightforward, which is a broad and deep and militant social movement and an electoral arm that will actually represent that social movement. Yes. Right? Yes. You right. can't have one without the other. And I want to be clear that that electoral arm needs to come out of from and accountable and responsible to the social movement. And because that's the sweet spot, Tom. That's the sweet spot whenever you actually have that opportunity for those two things to take place. Now, some of you know I was reared in rural poverty. I grew up in a house without a flush toilet. I don't say that so you'll pat me on the head or so you'll feel sorry for me. I say that so that you can understand that that's how I see the world. Economic oppression was very real to me because I lived it. It was my lived experience. So it pisses me off whenever I see the wealthy taking advantage of the work that we do to make this country go and then don't share it. It pisses me off. And frankly, I think as progressives, we make a mistake when we don't articulate that anger and we allow the Tea Party to be the only voice. our final keynote speaker. Because Sherry Honkala, like me, was born in poverty. Sherry Honkala was born into poverty in urban poverty, which is, I have come to know, even worse than rural poverty. And let me tell you, rural poverty ain't no picnic. But she was born into urban poverty, and then uh, in an act what I can only call self-help actually had to run away from an abusive home as a young woman. And I think that that ought to be applauded, too. Yeah. That's actually courage. And then, as a young, unwed mother, she was living on the streets because she knew she had to keep her family together. That's family values. That's family values. You keep your family together. And, in an act of brilliance, began to organize poor, women who had nothing to protect themselves into what became the Kensington Welfare Rights Union. To fight for their own rights, to fight for themselves, to represent themselves. She has gone on to become an iconic figure. And I'll admit the same thing, I'll steal Ben Mansky. I actually knew as an organizer, Sherry Honkula was an iconic figure before I got to know Sherry Honkula, the person. And I'm proud to say that the person actually meets the icon. That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Sherry Honkla 
went on to become a Mother Jones Hellraiser of the Year. <laughs> Sherry Honkluff went on to become a Ms. Magazine's Woman of the Year. Sherry Honkluff went on to become a human rights activist that is applauded and lauded all across the world. And what I think is particularly interesting is now doing something that Mayor Soglin did, Tom Hayden did, Dan Mansky did, David Cobb did, many of you did, which is she's preparing to use an election, and follow me here, an election as an arena of struggle. Right? We should think about elections that way. Elections are not just where we're going to try to elect somebody to represent us. We, as committed social change agents, enter into the election process because we see that that is a place where the state legitimizes itself, and we're going to play. We're not going to leave it to the professional politicians. So Sherry Honkala, in the middle of a great so-called economic crisis, it's not an economic crisis, there's more money being generated by this economy than the world has ever seen. It's only an allocation crisis, let's be clear about that. <laughs> is now running, and if you don't know this, I'm going to ask each and every one of you to go home from this conference and blog about, write about what I believe should be the single most exciting electoral campaign in 2011. Because ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, may I say comrades, in November 2011, Sherry Honkala, an iconic fighter for social justice who has used all the tools in the toolbox, is going to be running for sheriff of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Why, Sheriff, you may ask? I'm glad you did. <laughs> it's because the Sheriff in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania serves eviction notices and foreclosures. You know, that in the midst of the great crisis of evictions and foreclosures, how would you like to vote for a sheriff whose campaign is no evictions, no foreclosures, everybody stays in their home? If you live in Philadelphia, you can vote for her. But if you don't live in Philadelphia, you can support her. Yes, by money if you can, but more important, by generating the buzz to support her using social media, using social networks, using the internet, using blogs, using Facebook, tweeting on this. we got to go around the corporate media and talk to the ordinary Americans who are looking for a champion like Sherry Honkala. We can all help elect Sherry Honkala, but right now we can welcome her to the Democracy Convention. Right. Sherry Honkala! Yeah. 
year who are going to start the general strike. <laughs> say no, and so <laughs> here I am. <laughs> you know, I want to thank the organizers of this event. After being an organizer for not as many years as my colleague here, um, I really appreciate all the work that goes into making a conference. But I really believe that this is a historical conference and that these are historical times. And there's a whole new paradigm shift that's taking place. After all, I felt it yesterday in Philadelphia <laughs> with, the earth, with the earthquake. <laughs> you know, everybody was running out of the buildings. They were like, oh my god, an earthquake. I had friends you know, texting me from California, now you know how we feel. <laughs> <laughs> They're really concerned about us. <laughs> People standing outside their offices, you know, because they were going back and forth a little bit. And, uh, you know, everybody was out there doing their regular prayers. <laughs> and I was doing mine. God, you know, help me pay rent this month. <laughs> help me be able to keep the heat on. <clears throat> helping have enough money to have some food. As I decide to do something crazy, but like run for political office as a single mother in Philadelphia. Well, I think God is trying to tell us to do something different this year. And it goes something like this. Shut up and stop adjusting to a lower standard of living. <laughs> <laughs> that we have a responsibility, especially those of us, those of you that live here in Wisconsin, we stand on many great shoulders. The fight against slavery, the fight that took place here this year in Wisconsin. That silence now is really betrayal, especially now when this year, another million families will be thrown out of their homes due to foreclosure. At the same time that the banks received billions of dollars in bailout. And our elected officials are standing there doing nothing. Well, David spoke to some of this, but I am a product of my environment and my history. As a formerly homeless mother, I learned some important lessons coming from the Midwest. Living as a homeless mother in Minnesota, I knew what it was like on that cold winter night when I decided to do something like break the law and to survive. Because I had learned about this concept that through the Midwest, they keep these homes on they keep the heat on in the winter time so that the pipes don't freeze. And I decided that as a poor mother, a homeless mother, who couldn't get into shelter in the Twin Cities, that damn it, I was just as important as those pipes and so was my son. And I began the process of taking over abandoned government owned empty homes. of getting arrested somewhere is up to two, three times on a daily basis. And this was before the time when they had cell phones. So my older son, Mark, he would go down to the corner with quarters in his pocket, put them in the telephone, and call my friends. You see, at the time, I didn't realize that was organization. <laughs> being like the homeless mother fighting back who was courageous to now a professional organizer. <laughs> and so the papers, you know, they, I, it was fun to watch that shift in the papers as well, right? I went from, you know, the poor homeless mother being denied shelter to 
horrible, radical agitator. <laughs> and I would learn so several of those lessons throughout my life. For over the last 25 years, I've fought hard. I've done things that I've never wanted to do before. Teach people how to build homeless encampments in urban areas, which then began to be known as tent cities, stealing ideas from the Great Depression, creating not these wonderful books here, maybe someday they will be like that, but pamphlets and distributing them throughout the country on how to take over abandoned houses and how to fight foreclosure. mothers and fathers that I fought and worked with, African American women in the South, the books upon books that I read, whether I was at a homeless encampment or in a takeover house, and I also learned from the people around me, the children that will never be talked about unless I talk about them, who at eight years old sat in with me to guarantee housing for other families and were arrested. Nothing you'll ever see on, the C on CNN or the nightly news or anything like that, but the countless numbers of thousands of families across this country that have been participating in a fight to take their country back. One time, you know, the opening of the Constitution Center you know, I have the benefit because I live in Philadelphia, so I figured out how to use every symbolic historical <laughs> thing to my advantage. You know, I think I'm the only woman, I have to research this, but uh, I think I'm the only woman that did six months daily reporting probation, forget this, obstructing the view of the Liberty Bell. <laughs> I bought a ticket because I wanted to make sure I had that in my pocket. 
um, because you know whenever there's a big event that happens anywhere in the country, I usually miss it. Like I miss the WTO. I arrived at the WTO and me and Ward Morehouse went to jail um, before the whole thing got started. I missed all the fun. <laughs> um, we just arrived and we went to jail. But um, so I was always prepared um, to perhaps miss out on any big event because I usually went to jail before the event happened. <laughs> so um, as we're walking down the street with the mattresses, and I'm carrying one end of the mattress, um, we got to the front of the Constitution Center, and we were there, and we said, you know, we're here to amend the Constitution. And um, they didn't think it was funny. <laughs> charged with seven felonies for aggravated assault on a police officer. And uh, so then I began the first in a series of arrests for aggravated assault in my life. I was facing 22 years in oh prison. And um, thank God for independent media, because I don't go any place without them anymore. <laughs> but while we were in the courtroom, you know, one ranking officer after another took the stand. It was like, you know, a reunion for law enforcement that day in my courtroom. And they each took the stand and they all perjured themselves. And then um, my lawyer, it was that, you know, glove moment. Um, <laughs> so he pulls into his briefcase and he pulls out um, the video of the entire day's incident where I'm carrying a mattress. And, uh, you know, the officers begin to look at each other and freak out because uh, they have to find somebody that's responsible for this. So some poor officer uh, ended up being the fall guy in the situation and uh, he lost his job on the force. Wow. Um, but I tell you that story uh, because then I figured, wow, I'm going to be like famous. Everybody's going to know how horrible the Philadelphia police are. And so, you know, a week later, we distributed it to every single media outlet in Philadelphia. We were like, whoa, we got them. We're going to have a massive lawsuit. I'll be able to feed and house everybody across America. <laughs> <laughs> and then the press conference, uh, we called the press conference, and the next thing I knew, I got a call from the mayor on the phone. And the mayor says to me, uh, Sherry, I think you should really call off the press conference. And I said, no, we're not going to call out the press conference. We're going forward with this press conference. And so we see all this press coming and that kind of stuff. And the next thing I know, something's happening in the mayor's office and all of our press leave. Oh, wow. <laughs> all of our press leave. So anyway, so the moral of the story is, is um, I have to tell you these stories because uh, separate of independent media, the people that participated in them, you would never know about them. Mm -hmm. And these are important stories to tell. Yeah. Because now we're living in a time where we're dealing with billions of dollars that are being used to preempt our civil liberties and to teach us that somehow there's terrorism, terrorists out there, when we're really dealing with the terrorists here at home.
um, during the Republican, the last Republican National Convention in Minneapolis, um, in which I got a call from the Justice Department in Chicago before the, the march. I mean, how dangerous could it be? I have like a history of organizing very large marches for like the last 10 years during conventions, and we're always peaceful and nothing ever happens. I got a good track record, but the Justice Department called me from Chicago and said, you know, Sherry, you can't go forward with this march because we're afraid for your life and we're afraid for the life of some of the others that are on your march. And in particular, when you get in front of the Capitol and you get in front of the St. Paul Jail, you can't really guarantee your safety. Oh my God. <laughs> and I said, right. what? <laughs> And then I realized that I needed to turn around and tell them in front of media again that, damn it, you better guarantee my safety. <laughs> because uh, if, you, if you have some prior intelligence that says that something's going to happen to somebody, you better do your job. And needless to say, everybody, at least hopefully in the Midwest, because the rest of the country never knew about it, the most horrendous kind of violence happened. The, you know, the Fox News was embedded with the police. The uh, arresting of 80 reporters. You know, so when we talk about building this kind of movement for a new kind of society, we can't just talk about our side. There is another side, and they're organized, and they're dangerous. And so we have to remember that throughout history, people have always had to encounter this question. How do I move forward? How do I not become immobilized by fear? So I gotta tell you the truth. School, editing elementary school, to talk about any issue, any hard issue, whether it's race or gender or whatever, and they'll talk about those issues. But if you ask them, are you poor? even if they all live in the same housing project, even if their mother is losing their home, or even if their address is a car, they will not tell you. Because they're more ashamed of that, even though down the block, their neighbor is in foreclosure, and then the one on the next block's in foreclosure, and then their other friend is in foreclosure. There's 14 million unemployed, 43 million below poverty, 50 million uninsured, and 3.5 million homeless. This last year, my sister lost her home after 20 years. My friend, dying of AIDS, I told and pleaded with Judge Fox not to go forward with his injectment because the throw him out of his home right now would potentially kill him. The judge and the bank went forward. My campaign office right now in Philadelphia is located next to the largest disability organization in the country. They just laid off 180 disabled workers who will probably never work again in their life. We have the second highest hunger rate in America now in Philadelphia. And people are groveling to, to, to figure out how to feed people. In Philadelphia, we spent more money on prisons than education. And across this country, we continue to spend more money on war. So this year, I had to make that decision. I had to have my own earth shift by deciding to run for Philly, in Philly as the people's sheriff. Somebody that will protect the people, not the banks, the developers, the speculators. The and modify the loans, 
Well then, damn it, I will refuse to throw any person in Philadelphia out of their home.
wanted to know about the keynotes. They always want to know about the keynotes. <laughs> and I said to them, in my opinion, Sherry Pankala is the leading advocate for poor people's rights. Yeah. And she is one of the leading advocates for democracy in the United States. And you haven't heard of her because advocates for poor people's rights don't appear on Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> they don't appear on MSNBC either. Right. Sherry, Tom, thank you so much. I mean, I again, everything has been a goodwill offering here. There's nobody who's getting paid to come and speak. Uh, there's nobody who uh, is, is here who uh, uh, was uh, difficult to get here. <laughs> like all of you, Tom Hayden, Sherry Honkala, Paul Soglin, wanted to be here because they know that we are building something that is historic, that will be successful because we have to be successful. Please, thank you to our keto speakers. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> a commemorative print by Sam at Firecracker Studios here in Madison to commemorate the wave that Wisconsin is still riding. <laughs> Limited edition, we'll have these framed for you. And uh, please, uh, join me in uh, giving this gift.